Welcome to Key County Connects, where we connect you with some of the important issues in the county and in our region. I'm Enrique Cerna. King County's growth is off the charts, and in many areas, so are the housing prices. And as housing prices go up, so do property taxes. Joining me now to talk about housing and property taxes is King County Assessor John Arthur Wilson, the man who oversees all of this and sends us our notices telling us uh, just how much our property taxes are going to go, usually up, not down. So thanks for being here, John. Good to see you, Henry King. Let me ask you first, when you go out and you talk to people um, about property taxes, what are you hearing about their concerns? I mean, we know we have tremendous growth here, but what are they saying to you? You know, I, I think across the spectrum, whether you're young or old, uh, middle income, uh, working poor, if you're a homeowner, it's causing increasing anxiety with people. A couple of months ago, I was out talking to a group of retired state employees. So these weren't people that were anti-government, that they, they knew how government worked because they'd been on the inside. And I literally had one woman who was in her uh, probably mid-70s or so. And the anxiety with her was, honest to God, palpable. You could feel it. And, and she finally said, Mr. Wilson, I, I don't blame you. I understand, but I think I'm gonna have to sell my house. I can't afford the property taxes on it anymore. And I hear that more and more. And I hear it from people, you know, where if you know a bit about their background, you go, wow, if, if they're reacting this way, what are other people reacting? To? So it's become a real issue. Part of it is, is you have a lot of folks who, you know, maybe they did their retirement plan. They stowed money away in their, you know, either approved retirement plan or a 401k. But they never anticipated that their property tax was going to be six, eight, ten thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you see people, and I hear story after story of people where, you know, their mortgage was two fifty a month. Well, their property taxes are now five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars a month, and they're living on fixed income. So it, it's become a, a, a real issue, and it's it's this quandary of. of Rising real estate prices are certainly an indicator of the tremendous economic success and vitality of the region, and, and you don't want to mess that up. But somehow we've got to figure out how we rebalance the system so we don't rely so heavily on the property tax. We know this, this growth uh, has brought many people to this region from other places. As you mentioned, the housing prices, uh, not just buying a home or trying to buy a home, is difficult. We know that trying even to buy, get an apartment is, is difficult for people. Um, I guess what what can happen or what needs to happen to try to balance, as you say, kind of balance things out because we have other needs with the growing numbers of people coming in and also on the statewide level we have an education system where you know the legislature has been going through this uh, real no, numerous legislative sessions to try to meet the McCleary decision uh, demands. And, and it, it looks, as we know right now, that the solution that the legislature has arrived at for a McCleary uh, funding package is going to involve the property, property tax. tax yeah. um, and in some parts of the state, it'll mean a, a net reduction. The, the risk for people in Seattle and King County is it could actually mean an increase in certain areas. You, you know, I, I think. Part of it, Enrique, is, is we need to step back and say, kind of look at two sides of the equation. H how can we become more efficient as governments? And, and this is one of the things I'm very proud of what King County has done over these last f five to eight years, is we've really worked on becoming more efficient. We've done some things in assessments I'm really proud of. But at the same time, we've got to look at how we modernize the way we generate revenue. I'll give you a couple quick examples of, of where our revenue models are out of sync with reality. We, for years, have funded 911 through a tax on both landlines and, and cell phones. Okay, um, I have four kids. Not one of them has a landline. <laughs> I think at least two of them don't even know what they are. I don't have a landline. Yeah, well, I do. And, and a friend of mine was at my house said, how quaint of you. I said, I'm old school that way. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is, is that the, the funding for something as vital as 911 is tied to 
a, a phenomena that is literally disappearing That's on great. us. And those landlines aren't coming back. I'll bet you you're not going to go out now and, and, and get one. I have no reason to. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you look at the other area, for example, of the gas tax, uh, where what you're seeing is because of increased efficiency in automobiles and trucks, um, different fuels, uh, hybrids, all electric, the, the rise of mass transit and all of that, the gas tax is flat or declining in many cases, but the number of road miles are actually increasing. We fundamentally have a tax system that is no longer aligned with, with how we generate revenue and how we generate societal services. And we somehow need to step back and say, let's take another look at this and let's look at a system that's a little bit more fair and equitable that doesn't place so much of the burden on the taxpayer because you know one of the things that I also hear increasingly that worries me is I'm starting to hear people that that if if you asked them sort of their voter profile it would be if you will classic King County Democrat small D big D whatever but they're now starting to say, maybe we ought to do what California did. Maybe we ought to do that Prop 13 thing. <laughs> and you go, whoa, wait a yeah, minute. Yeah. You, you know, the impacts of that. And do they know the history of how the impact of that? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that. And, but it gives you a sense of how frustrated and anxious people have become about property taxes. Right. Well, within the property tax conversation, I mean, here in Seattle is the conversation about an income tax. Uh, and, of course, you know, that we've tried to uh, pass income tax here uh, numerous times since the Dan Evans era and all of that. What's your take on some of that talk? Well, I, I understand what's, what's driving it at the city. The city of Olympia tried it and it failed there on a municipal level. You know, the, the, the problem you've got is I think a lot of legal people I've talked to say it's almost certainly unconstitutional at a municipal level. And it's, again, it doesn't deal with the systemic issues we have statewide. We really need to look at a statewide solution or package of solutions uh, and, and need to look at probably how you rebalance our tax structure, not simply what more can we add on to it. Yeah. In your job, I mean, you're the guy that's assessing what is going to be the 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 cost of that people are going to pay for property taxes. Um, what are you doing to try to, I guess, modernize the system that you're dealing with? And what does that mean to the everyday citizen that's out there? What changes are you trying to bring about? So we, we've, we've done several things. Like one of the things we did is uh, about five years ago, we were literally the first department in the nation to develop a mobile application to do field data collection. Mm -hmm. and, and what that's done is allowed us to collect more accurate and timely data out in the field so that we can get a sense of w what changes happen with that house. Um, it's also meant that our people have become much more efficient. Uh, it, it's increased the productivity in the department uh, that we're getting um, as much work done as if we had added eight to ten people but with the existing staff. So it's a huge efficiency gain. W what it also does though is sets up so, so that we have better information that we can more precisely and with greater reliability, we think, set what those market assessed values are. Um, and, and that ultimately helps the taxpayer have some hopefully greater confidence that we're, we're close to the market. Now, one needs to understand, we, because we set values effective January 1 of a year. So the values and the, the valuation notices you're getting right now through the mail, those are set for, for values that were set at the first of the year. So, so there's always going to be a market lag, but what we're trying to do is, is, is look at how we reduce some of that lag and become a little bit more timely. How is this growth affecting the work that you do in, in the assessments? It, it makes it harder in some cases. I mean, some of it simply, if you will, is logistics. We, we put a, about 140 people out on the street each day to do physical inspection of properties, commercial, residential, and all that, traveling all around the county. Part of what we've seen that we can't avoid is their travel time is dramatically increased. What used to take 30 minutes now takes 45 to get to, maybe an hour. Um, it's just harder to get around sections of the county. What we're also seeing is, 
I, I think because of the way real estate prices have responded, more and more people are stepping back and saying, well, I could sell the house and take the equity, but then I'm not sure if I could buy anything. Right. That's always the big challenge. So maybe what I need to do is remodel. So we're seeing a lot more remodeling starting again, which means we've got to be on top of that as far as making sure that we capture what's that new value that you've added to the property and, and, and that. Um, so those are some of the challenges. You, you know, um, we're seeing phenomena that we're not quite sure what they are yet. It, for example, if you take your house and use it as an Airbnb periodically, are you still a residential property or are you a commercial mm -hmm. property? How much Airbnb do you need to be to be <laughs> a commercial? Um, we're seeing things like apartments. Okay, um, we're not generally condoizing them, so we're not looking at specific taxpayer to apartment, but nevertheless, how do you set a value on a building filled with those? Um, there, there are a lot of these things where the market is literally changing before our eyes and we're trying to get a better handle on what does that mean toward values. Sounds like the media business where we're trying to figure out where we're going. And, and, you know. it, it, it's not online and it's driven by some of the same things. I, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you see clearly that the whole world of digital and, if you will, the whole world of Amazon, which has affected the media and it's affecting us. You know, we, we on the one hand, you, you know, how do you establish a value on a geodesic dome? I, I <laughs> you know, we're going to find out. Um, uh, on, how, how do you go about doing that? Well, well you got to measure really carefully. Yeah. Um, and, and, that, <laughs> and it depends on use and, and, and that. So it is, is it depending on measuring in size yeah, and yeah, where well, it's it depends, at and all yeah, of that? Well, 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 how big is I it? Never what's thought it being about used that for? Before. Things like that. Well, for example, a couple of years ago, one of the challenges we had was how do you establish the value on the Gates Foundation complex at the center? Because um, there's no comparative world's largest philanthropic foundation in Seattle that you can go, well, if the Gates Foundation is this, the, the Wilson Foundation, well, the Wilson Foundation is really small, <laughs> um, but, but we had to work with them to figure out, okay, what do you use as comparables? And, and we went as far as to like the Ford Foundation and the Mellon Foundation trying to figure out, and, and we finally sort of had to sit down with them, and they were very cooperative with us of nailing down, okay, what did you spend on this? And be, because they had a lot of both amazing tech features, also because of the number of world leaders. They often hosted the foundation headquarters. They had security issues that weren't typical of a commercial building. I think the census said recently, it's been reported that a thousand people a week, new people a week are coming to uh, the Seattle area in King County. What does that mean to property values and assessments. Have you figured that out yet? N not exactly, except that you, you, know, you, you know that um, b barring the notion that some people have that we're able to suspend the law of supply and demand, it continues to increase the demand for housing at probably a significantly faster clip than we're building it. And that undoubtedly ends up raising the price of things and raising the value of properties. You, you know, you, you see um, we live in the Roosevelt neighborhood. We had a house a, a little over a year ago, went on the market for $760,000. Not in the city these days, seemingly an unreasonable property uh, price. It sold in three days for $900,000. A couple of weeks later, I was in talking to other assessors from around the state, and one of them said, well, the average home in my county is worth $140,000. I said, that's great, but I have houses in my county that go up that much in 72 hours. Wow. So, you know, it, it skews Seattle in that, and it starts to have impacts on both clearly where people live, how people live, where people work, how people work, what industries or businesses will locate in King County, and which ones will start to migrate outside of King County. So it could affect us, our economy, our bottom line, and our growth. Yeah, it, particularly from a, from it, 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 it's one of the challenges of affordability, and again, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, we're, we're having this tremendous boon in real estate because we're having a tremendous boon in, in our overall economic activity. But at some juncture, you run the risk 
that, that the cost of housing starts to outstrip the capacity of the business sector or the public sector to provide jobs at an income level that can afford that. You saw that happen, frankly, up in Vancouver, BC, where, where housing prices so rocketed upward that both the provincial government tried to impose uh, a, a surcharge on overseas buyers but then also was struggling that a lot of the companies, especially in kind of the, the, the tech sector that had moved into the lower mainland, found themselves increasingly going, well, we want to expand, but we're not going to expand in Vancouver. We're going to maybe, you know, hop the, the inland and, and go to Victoria, or we're going to go, you know, east to like Calgary or to Toronto. Um, so you start to see also a shifting of, of some of the economic dynamics. And, you know, part of what we have to remember here is, is for all the spectacular natural beauty of this region, a, a lot of the kinds of industries that are growing here are not physically anchored here. They don't have to be here. Now, no, you can't plop a deep water port in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's true. But a lot of the high tech stuff is very movable, both nationally and as we both know internationally and so that's part of my concern is how do we get a handle on property values and property prices so that we're not undermining our own long-term economic viability yeah and what about the shift that we're seeing of people that are being pushed out of seattle and going south or wherever else that they could try to find something that's more affordable um, that seems to me to be changing the dynamic not only of Seattle, and we talked about this some, um, but also really uh, just the county. And, and, and it's, it's, it's happening in several ways. I, I mean, it, it, it's happening at the residential level where you see as neighborhoods gentrify, older residents that, that bought years ago simply reach a point where they say, I've got to move. Now, the, the, to me, the disturbing thing about that is we really are then tearing people kind of out of the social fabric. And, and we're saying, I'm sorry, but you can't afford to live here anymore. You have to move somewhere else. And, and that means the church, the pharmacist, the, the, the neighbors, the, the, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the host of things that we all have as part of that social fabric of ours. Uh, communities, the African-American community. Exactly. You that. see it shifting southward. The other thing that it relates to is in increasingly what you see happening with small local business and, and that, and especially often family and ethnically owned businesses, is they start to get pressured in part because their, their clientele moves on them. Also that they find that all the new building going in, yes, there's ground level retail, but they can't afford the ground level retail. And, and so it either sits vacant or it gets occupied by, you know, the mandatory national um, espresso chain, which shall be nameless, but somewhere <laughs> down we on Utah it Street. Is, yeah. uh, or or you, you end up with a national bank and maybe a, a franchise element of that. But if, if you had that really cool little shop that, that catered to the black community or the Latino community or that, they're starting to ask themselves, I'm not sure we can afford to stay here. And, and so it starts to change the character of the community and the character of the county. And it's part of a discussion I think we need to have at a larger scale of, is that what we want to become? Because then you become kind of generic, I'm afraid, that you lose some of those things. You know, it's one of the charming things, if you will, about Austin, Texas, is their motto is, keep Austin weird. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, they seem to have succeeded. But, but it's kind of a Texas thing. Too. <laughs> yeah, it is too. Um, but, but, but part of it's the challenge of how do we try to retain the, 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 the things that for folks like us make the Northwest great and a place that we've lived for decades, but also embrace the fact that we're changing and evolving, but not forget and destroy our past, but embrace our past. I'm curious, how do you see your role in that conversation? because an assessor's job is to assess and properties and, and, and these types of things, a little bit of number crunching, all of that. How do you see the role of your office and how you are, are involved in it in these types of conversation? Because in a way, they're conversations about our, our social and cultural future. Sure. And identity. 
Well, you know, if you will, on a broad global scale, I view that part of my duty as assessor is to try to create a, a, a stable and reliable financial foundation for vital local services. That's what the property tax is supposed to fund. Mm -hmm. But to get there, part of it is creating stable, reliable, sustainable communities. So, you know, it's, it's a couple things. One is you start to look really hard at how do we make sure we're literally not taxing seniors out of their home? Uh, you, you know, the, the state's made some effort. There are more efforts underway to try to uh, use the senior exemption program that now exists. One of the things since I took office last year that I've been very aggressive about is, is pushing enrollment of that. So we've actually brought in over the last year and a half nearly 6,000 new applications of a program that total before I took office had only 15,000 people enrolled in it. So uh, almost 40% increase of, of applicants to the program. That helps, but it only helps so much. There are lots of people that right now that program leaves behind. And there's also some abuse of the program that we need to, to take care of. So, so there's that facet. The other facet in terms of, of community is, is I think in deals with property tax policy of looking at two important things. One is what can we do to incentivize, protect, and, and kind of nurture existing affordable housing? Because mm -hmm. the fastest and cheapest affordable housing is preserving that housing we already have. And, and then the, the second area kind of is, is assessing that maybe we don't always need to tax all properties to the so-called highest and best use, because that's part of what's driving the gentrification. And so you have to ask yourself in some cases, such as in the retail sector, is there a community benefit to certain kinds of property use that extends beyond just you know, what that piece of ground would be worth? Is there by having these kind of businesses or this kind of function in the community, is there a community benefit to that? Um, what's the community benefit of having, you know, a, a, a vibrant port-related industrial sector, for example? So there are those kind of things that I think the assessor can and should weigh in on, on how does that help create the kind of sustainable community and the sustainable property tax base that allows us to continue. As you see this shift of the can more and more people heading south, um, what is that what is that doing to, uh, well, property taxes and assessments and the impact in those areas? Because it's changing. Now. Sure. Well, and, and, and you see, you know, it, it has impacts in several ways. I, I mean, it drives up the cost of housing, which drives up property taxes. In turn, what you see, for example, in, in the Auburn area, um, their property taxes this past year went up 18%, higher than the county average, which was uh, a little over 9 Part of why they went up so much, though, is Auburn has had such amazing growth, and especially of young families, that they needed to put on the, the, the ballot a significant school levy. Perfectly justified, but that goes into the, the equation of the property taxes. And so what you're starting to see is some of those communities are, are facing infrastructure needs, transportation, housing, education, that, that are going to also cause, at least under our present system, property taxes to keep going up. And those areas may see their property taxes actually go up at a faster pace than some of the older, more established areas, including both Seattle and, say, Bellevue or Kirkland. Mm -hmm. are, you, are we being affected in your role and in, in your job um, by what's happening on the federal level? and kind of all the uncertainty and unpredictability there. Yeah, we, we, we are. You, you know, one of the things we've seen in the last six, eight months is it, it has become more of a challenge for our people out in the field, especially when they're dealing with, with immigrant communities and in particular the Latino community. Understandably, they literally fear that we're here as part of the advance guard of the federal government to deport them. And we do our very best to assure people that's not at all our role. 
We're not a party to that. What we simply need to do is try to determine what the value is on your property. But our field appraisers run into a level of anxiousness that they didn't see two years ago. Hmm. So how are, how are you dealing with that? Um, we're looking at how to communicate more effectively across cultural boundaries so that people have a better sense of what we're there for. We've, we've ramped up in particular this year an effort addressed at both Latino homeowners and Latino business owners. Um, we, we have tried to go into community centers and community-based organizations to, to better clarify for them what are we doing um, we're mindful of, we, we physically inspect a property once every six years. We do different, a kind of patchwork of the county each year so that we're not doing any, just one section of it. But we're trying to be mindful of, okay, where are we, where are we going to be going, and what kind of outreach effort. So all of that is stuff that we've had to frankly kind of amp up over the last year that wasn't quite so much an issue two years ago. And, and do you think do you, are you looking to have people that can translate for you that are, yeah. that are bilingual to help you as well? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at all <laughs> of that kind of stuff. We're, we're right now in the process of, of trying to figure out how to design a, a web-based portal that would be more language friendly to, because we have taxpayers. You know, you, you, you see it come, you know, when people pay their property taxes, the amazing cultural array of people that come to the office. And so we've been working with us and Treasury and, and, and others in the county to try to improve how our co cultural competency makes sure we can deliver the service those people deserve. Yeah. Very changing uh, systems for the, uh, the assessor's office. I mean, I think it kind of reflects just how our whole world is changing. Yeah, the, I, I mean, if, if you if you were coming into this office thinking you you were just going to sit back and you, you know eat bonbons and watch video games, that's not <laughs> quite been the deal here. Um, but but it's it, it's also been exciting. It poses a lot of challenges, and and we've had to ask ourselves some tough questions. Uh, you know, are we doing it the right way? Are we being fair to people? How, are we missing people in ways that um, e either, you know, through uh, not understanding communities or not being able to communicate effectively? Uh, th th there are lots of things. It's at the same time a need that we have to modernize our systems. We're looking right now at how we take a, a computer-based system that we run our entire assessments process on that, that fundamentally dates back to the 70s mm. and bring it into the 21st century. That's a huge project, but we're trying to do it in a way that, that is cost effective, gives us some greater flexibility. We're trying to figure out how can we put more tools in the hands of you, the taxpayer, so that it's easier for you to look up information, but also easier for you to file things so that you're not having to print out a bunch of documents and send us a big fat envelope, but be able to do it online. And, and that, you know, part of what we're seeing is the interesting kind of information generational switch that even among seniors, so many of them now have a smartphone mm -hmm. and that, you know, in, in my ideal world, I, I would see where we'd eventually like to get that property tax appeals could be done via video conferencing. So you could literally, you know, hold your smartphone right. and participate in it. Um, and you know, people five years ago would have said that ridiculous. But you know, you, you you look at how we now communicate with our kids or grandkids, and in, in, in my case, and, and you go to a lot of folks that are sixty plus. That technology is not nearly as off-putting as it was because it's how I communicate with my family. Right, right. Plus the fact that you could avoid traffic having to drive to uh, the, well, yeah. the office no, to deal see, with all I, of this. I mean, you, you know, I, I, I hear as I go around the county from, yeah. from people who go, I would have appealed, but I don't want to have to come in to downtown. And, you know, the, mm -hmm. it, one of the things, one of the reasons we did when we built the, the state's first online tax appeal system is we gave you a calculator, a wizard we called it, so that you could figure out, well, if I lower my property tax value by X, what will my property tax refund look like? Because you sometimes saw people that 
the, the difference was so small that when you factored in driving in, finding parking, having lunch, to appear to your hearing, you'd actually lose money if you <laughs> filed your appeal. Yeah. And, and we said, well, let's make sure people understand, is it worth it and, and, and that. Changing uh, just the whole, the changing identity of the county, the changing identity of our systems and, and how they're all working. So it's, it's um, your job and this role is, uh, it's constant change. It, it, it really is. I mean, you know, we, we just find, and this is something I've talked to our staff about, is, is no one in our department is going to be immune from change over the next five years. Um, and, you know, we, we see it across the board, whether you're out in the field or in the office. You see it by the kinds of questions that are coming into public information. Obviously now a lot of them come in via email or phone, but there's still a lot of people who come in and, and, and they've got questions that, you know, probably didn't come up very much five, ten years ago that are now more and more common. And, and so we're having to drill down on that. People are much more attuned to looking up data online and, and to their credit saying, hey, you haven't got this quite right. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we track 700,000 parcels every year. I'm not going to tell you that we got every single one of them right. And so what we ask people is, look, if you see something you think is a mistake, please let us know. We'll fix it if we're wrong. Um, but it's been interesting that the people are getting savvier about looking on our website and going, y you know, I, I don't have five of those. I got three. And you, what, right. and you go, okay. And, and we make those changes. King County Assessor John Arthur Wilson, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. It's been fascinating to see the changing role of this department, but also uh, the dynamics of everything that's happening out there that's affecting the work that you do and, and ultimately uh, how people are dealing with their property taxes and, and other issues as well. Appreciate your time. Thanks All much, right. Enrique. And thank you for joining us today. Please visit us online at kingcounty.gov slash KCTV. I'm Enrique Cerna, and we'll see you next time.